Hello, and welcome to the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1 US, a podcast in which we explore the mind-bending world of global supply chain, covering topics such as automation, innovation, unique identity, and more. I'm your co-host, Reed. And I'm Liz. And welcome to the show. Hello, I hope that you're having a great day. Today's guest is Ryan Treft, and he's the co-founder of Resale.com. And in today's conversation, we're going to be talking about returns, reverse logistics, and the surprising importance of GTINs. I was not expecting this from this conversation at all. And Ryan even admitted, he's like, I didn't see any need for GTINs or UPCs in our business. And now it's a linchpin for us and enables efficiencies. Very interesting conversation about reverse logistics and returns. I hope you enjoy. Hey, Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you. You're my first Real interview that I've done inside this business. We've been laying low, but we're finally going to come out of the woodwork here. We're happy to have you here. And I want to dive right into this. We see that online returns are a major contributor to millions of tons of textile waste that's produced every year. And as much as 25% of items have never been worn. This is like a big sustainability issue that we're seeing more and more being reported on. Can you tell us a little bit about resale.com? and how you're helping to solve this problem. So most people think of resale or re-commerce as used, I think. I don't think it's obvious to the average Joe, average Jane consumer that purchases three or four items online with the intent of keeping one, whether it's, oh, I'm going to size up, size down, try different colors. But it's so easy to send something back for most people. I personally don't return things that I purchase online, but I'm the exception. I'm not the norm. And I feel like some people in my household, I won't say who, it seems like they send more back than what they bring in, which I don't know how that works. But if you picture, especially with items like apparel or electronics, where there's a lot of SKUs and seasonality, where there's the next gen or the next catalog or the next relevant, whatever, by the time it comes back, it may or may not be on the website anymore. If you have thousands of SKUs, it would just pile up because it takes more time typically for a warehouse or a 3PL to process a return than to do outbound pick and pack. And so by the time that stuff goes back, that bin that it came out of may not even exist. So the odds are, especially for the large companies with a lot of SKUs in the right categories, it doesn't go back in the same bin that it came out of. And that's what I don't think that your average consumer understands. Oh, just because it's new with tags and because it's still in its packaging, surely they're going to take that item and put it right back and sell it again. That's not always the case. And depending on who the seller is, sometimes it's never the case, just depending on who they are. That's what resale focuses on. It's not used. It's not secondhand. It's the large amount that you would never assume would be there of goods that are new with tax that don't have a home anymore by the time they get back and they don't want to be dealt with because it's not just that individual item that was sent back. It's that individual item times however many thousands that showed up that day that have to be dealt with. That's the best use case for our technology. Talk to me a little bit more about your technology and how this comes into play, because I understand what you're talking about. It's there's a lot of net new stuff that has just been returned. The only difference in those products is that it's changed locations. The boxes aren't opened. The tags are still on things, all of that. But depending upon, and we don't need to get into it, but if it's apparel versus electronics, there's different handling requirements and needs and cleanings and all the other types of things. But Talk to us a little bit about your technology and what you're doing to kind of help with this. Yeah, so we operate out of a warehouse here in Salt Lake City and picture a truck showing up and let's say there's 20,000 items in that truck. The vast majority are unique items, unique SKUs, whether it's manifested or not, doesn't matter that much as far as we're concerned. I mean, our QC process is very simple. Is it new with tags? Is it not? And most of the companies that we deal with, because we're primarily working with enterprise retailers, sometimes we're working with brands where we're sort of their outsourced RTV, you could call it. But those are typically brands that say that dresses dropshipping on a high-end dropship site that has a very high return rate. But picture these coming back just as these messy pallets or messy truckloads. Nobody wants to deal with those. So they send them to us. If it's new with tags, which is 90 plus percent, given who we're working with. And if it's new with tags, we move it over to these carts. We go and we look for an empty bin location. And the process is very simple. We 
scan the UPC code, we scan the barcode on the bin location we're putting it in, and we're done. The scan will go out and retrieve all the information related to that product, the size, the color, the image, the description. And then because we sell not just in one marketplace, not just one channel, we resell those new tag only items in up to 29 different marketplaces. I say up to because if it's bed sheets versus a dress, not all channels right. are getting sell both. So in an automated fashion, we'll take that information, do the data enrichment and make a compliant listing for all the channels that have that category right then and there. And then we just wait for the order across any of the channels. So it's retrieving the info and then knowing what to do with that information to make it compliant and then having it cross-listed all at the same time. That's unique to us as far as I can tell. I've never seen anybody else that could do that. I can't take any credit for it. I just happened to meet the person that developed this over a decade, uh, a guy named Sachin in Miami. And when I tested it with a bunch of scattered inventory that I had and it worked, I said, Sachin, let's join forces here. And that's what we did. Just hearing how there are so many products that now get another life. Actually, a first chance at its life is cool. How does this relate to reverse logistics? Is this reverse logistics? It's one piece of reverse logistics. So you have return enablement companies like Tech Enablement, Loop Returns, Returnly, Happy Returns, Narvar. Primarily, those companies don't touch the goods. They enable a customer to say, hey, I want to send this back. And then the brand to communicate back, like, here's what you need to do to follow our process to get it back to us. Call that return enablement. Then there's processing and receiving, maybe grading and sorting. And typically those types of companies are going to resell by the pallet or truckload. So these are companies like B-Stock, Inmar, I think is the biggest. They're in North Carolina. There's Quick Lots in North Carolina. There's Zaps Wholesale, Optoro. Optoro is actually kind of a hybrid between those, the return enablement and then the call it recovery or disposition because they sell by the pallet as well. And ultimately that ends up in the hands of jobbers that don't have to pay very much for these goods because somebody has to go through the messy process of listing one-off items one by one. And then there's, call it re-commerce, where Tree, Trove, Otrium, Archive, Out and Back, Thread Up. Some of those are just tech platforms to help push like a re-commerce tab for all the used stuff. Thread Up is obviously more, as I understand the business, full service where just about anyone can send a used product or new to them and they do everything. They take a picture, they manually create a listing. And they push it back to ThreadUp's site, app, and they might even have some multi-channel as well. And then there's you know different tech companies that might work across some element. But as I see it, while we share similarities with all those companies in all those different categories, I think they're all more complementary than competitive to what we do, given that we only focus on new with tags. Primarily, we work with enterprise retailers that have branded products, and those products have a UPC code, right? A GS1, G10 UPC code. We can actually use an ASIN. We can use a unique identifier if we have a data source. Well, ASIN's easy, but we don't want it. And we take this very high-touch process of manually recreating or creating a listing, and we turn it into a low-touch process. But then that other step, to do the data enrichment simultaneously cast to multi-channel so that you can maximize the eyeballs going to that listing is fairly unique. You hit on a lot of different areas of reverse logistics, return enablement, process receiving, grading, sorting, re-commerce aspects of it, and a lot of complementary, a lot of hybrid, a lot of scenarios, and everyone's trying to find their niche and working in there. I'm gonna go back to a statement you made before there's more to the process of returns than there is to the pick pack order. So why do returns create so much problem for retailers and are better reverse logistics solutions the answer? I just like a better understanding of that. So I used to own a 3PL and I loved it when my clients would have the returns routed somewhere other than my warehouse. I didn't want to deal with it. It was the last thing that my labor force wanted to do. 
our primary job is to get orders out on time and to not screw it up. If we have a client that has a 5% return rate or a 30% return rate, I'm going to factor that in to my pricing and I'm going to punish them for their high return rate because now I get into all these individual complexities that could change from one client to the next. What's acceptable to put it back in the bin? That subjectivity is not an easy thing to automate. You can't automate something so subjective and you can't make that idiot proof. Whether or not it's something that is still on their website, I don't know. Maybe they don't even want to push it anymore. Maybe it's not on the site. So do I really want to put it back into a bin location that was there for when it went out? But what if they killed that SKU and it's not even on their site anymore? Or what if I just have one item and I created all this dead bin location space, right? We wouldn't have just filled up bins with 30 different SKUs for one company like we do here, by the way. We wouldn't have done that. And so for all those reasons, it's problematic. But then the other thing is somebody has to grade it and determine what condition is it in and how do you do that efficiently? Do you tie in customer service notes to say, oh, look out for this order. It'll look like it's new, but it's not. There's some interesting companies working on that aspect of it, which I think there's definitely a place for that. But it takes more time and labor to deal with the return Then to just go to a bin, scan the SKU to verify you picked the right thing and ship it out. That's quick. Dealing with it, touching it, determining condition, understanding, do I put this back in this location or not? That's problematic. And so over the last, I don't know, decade plus, the percentage of returns and exchanges has gone up year over year. So it's not just that returns are going up because e-com sales are going up and it's just following the same trend. No, no. Percentage-wise, people are more likely to sell goods back now than they've ever been. And that's just been growing. So it's becoming a major issue. And if you're a $10 million indie brand on Shopify with a 10% return rate, you can host a sample sale, a warehouse sale, a sidewalk sale, whatever you want to call it. And you can purge that stuff locally. That's pretty typical. I'm a partner in a couple of those types of companies. And twice a year, they'll band together with a dozen others that are of a similar size and they'll just blow stuff out. And it's like a block party of outdoor brands. That, that's what they do. And that's wise. That's what I would do. But what would a $5 billion, $10 billion enterprise retailer do with a 30 plus percent return and exchange rate? I mean, we're talking billions of dollars worth of goods that have to be dealt with. Just picture dealing with the sheer volume and the time it would take to efficiently relist it It's a big problem that has no easy solution to it. It's very interesting to hear you talk about this because as I start to think, like a lot of times we don't know what we don't know, right? And we haven't been involved. And sometimes the check you're writing is more expensive than the money you're sending. It's it's kind of this scenario. It's like, yeah, I I have to send a check for $2, but the shipping is going to cost me four. And it's just like, well, okay, why did we do that? But you have to because of the other side. Lots of little checks and balances. And it seems like this is just on a grander scale of all of that. It's people, it's space, yeah. it's rent, it's how long is it sitting there? And the seasonality was something I never thought of. And you hit me up on that. I mean, like even with electronics, there's that whole funny thing out there of how some guy makes millions of dollars selling dongles because Apple keeps changing their connections. And I have it now. I have to carry two cords because my iPad and my iPhone don't use the same connection anymore. And that's why a lot of the reverse companies have dabbled in taking high value items, dealing with it as a single item, creating a process to get it relisted in, say, one place like eBay, and then waiting for that order. But the one that I met with yesterday... That's what they do. And their primary business is moving goods in and out by the truckload or by the pallet where it ultimately ends up in the hands of a jobber. It's a side hustle business. It's very common to have a Poshmark seller, an eBay seller that buys a few pallets a month. They don't value their time (laughs) and they don't care about how much space they're taking up in their garage. It's just a cool little fun hobby business. It's lunch money stuff. How do you scale that? That's the difficult part, whether it's new with tags or not. Even the new stuff is difficult to scale when you're talking about this messy mixed lot stuff. That's why the scalable 
resellers and jobbers, they want depth of quantity. They want deep inventory. We're the opposite. We get more bang for our buck because the difference is that we get out of the automation to multi-channel. If I'm going to take in a million units into my warehouse, I actually want as close to a million unique items as possible, whereas most would not say that. They just want to count the inventory, manually create one listing, and just wait for those orders. But I mean, think about it. If you have a million units and say there's an average of 2,000 units per, you don't get any more listings. You can't sell the 2,000th item until you've sold one, two, three, four. But to have individuals have a million uniques, think of the difference in terms of like real estate taken up on these channels. So you get way more eyeballs and therefore you get way more bang for your buck. But nobody should even try this, would even try this at scale without creating some process to have it be efficient on the listing creation. I spend a lot of time in the food industry. And so a mixed lot palette is just a whole bunch of different things, right? A whole different bunch of food products or produce products on a palette. Is that the same? Yeah, exactly. So we want the messy stuff okay. that nobody wants to touch. And that's how we've been operating. I have 170,000 square feet here in Utah. But the end game right now, it's 90-10. 90% of our revenue are the goods that we physically handle. 10% comes from these companies that we're starting to just essentially beta test with for them to use our tech and sometimes to leverage our channels, but ideally set them up with their own kind of a teach a man to fish sort of thing, right? Let's play the long game. Let's get you set up with the same playbook. Use our tech to automate this. That's the real scalable piece. So right now that's 90-10. I would say over the next five years, you're going to see it shift towards 90-10 in the other direction because it's such a big problem across so many retailers dealing with so much returns that nobody wants to deal with it, that we have no business scaling according to what we touch in our own warehouses with fixed leases. The best thing we can do is give away our tech, make it affordable to use it, and just hand it out to others that right now, whether it's the retailer or the reverse logistics company that takes goods from the retailer, that's who should be using our tech because they can get a much greater recovery. There was a company that we took three containers last year from them. They, these were all goods that were meant to be discarded just because it was too messy for them to deal with. We brought it to our warehouse. We scanned in anything that was new with tags, which was probably 90%. And we sold through 80% of those goods in four weeks all three times. And that remaining 20%, it, they didn't really sell very well over time, but who cares, right? <laughs> like the difference in recovery, even if they sold it by the pallet or truckload to have it end up in flea markets, that would have been better than discarding it. But there was no great solution until they sent it to us and it's like, all right, we've proven that you can get six figures out of something that you were planning to pay to discard. After it had been shipped around multiple times, and after it had been touched multiple times to be consolidated only to be disposed. But it's like now, rather than send us more trucks, just set up a small location in your warehouse, the same warehouse that consolidated before they sent it to us. We'll fly out there and in a day, we'll set you up. We'll show you how to use the tech. It'll take just a few people and you can do the exact same thing. That's the end game. It's a tough sale to convince a large retailer to upend anything in their process, even when they know it's inefficient, that's a difficult thing. But to me, it's a no brainer to say like, okay, if you're getting X recovery or you're paying to discard versus a relatively simple solution that we will do the work to set up your people to do this in a day and you can get six figures in recovery. I mean, we paid them six figures for three containers, right? Out of sales. If they just did that for themselves, it's a better solution because now the shipping from yep. multiple states away to us, that's gone. And it just sits right there. So that's what we're trying to work toward. Our pitch now, when I say pitch, we've done zero outbound sales. That company that I mentioned, they heard about us word of mouth through a friend of mine. And he said, oh, if that's what you're working on, you need to talk to my old boss who's at this company in this state. And he's dealing with this problem and he doesn't know how to deal with it. That's how I got connected to them. Nobody really knows who resell.com is yet. Nobody really knows who we are, but quietly semi-stealth mode, 
we're just slowly proving this out so that at some point I want CEOs, COOs, CFOs, those that can see the true cost of what they're doing at scale and need a better solution. I want them to fly out here, not to say, oh, is this where we want to start sending the goods? I want them to see the process start to finish out of our facility so they can determine, do they want to take this back to one of their facilities and just follow the exact same process right where it's going now? Yeah, I can see how that sale is a little bit tough. It kind of reminds me of the cartoon of the person pulling a sled with goods on it and a guy standing next to him with four sets of wheels. And it's like, hey, I want to talk to you about how I can help you with your thing. Can't you see I'm busy right now working? It's kind of the same scenario you're in. And it's just, this is my job. This is my swim lane. We're big companies, efficiencies, but ESG, you know, yeah. environmental stuff is coming into it. We're starting to run out of time. I want to come back to a question here that you mentioned before. You'd mentioned the use of tagged goods with UPCs and GTINs, but you said you can take in ASINs and other identifiers. Why do you prefer GTINs? Why do you prefer UPCs over other identifiers? So it's more reliable to find accurate data we've noticed. Well, we know the source of product, and that's true in just about every case, because one thing we won't do is roll the dice on some unknown origin. For example, lost freight, we could do that. But if I don't know where it came from and it's lost packages and it's just random, people ship counterfeit goods. And I won't risk our credibility, particularly with the marketplaces that we sell through. I won't risk listing a counterfeit item and jeopardize those accounts and our relationship with those accounts. So we only work with credible companies that have branded products and obviously enterprise retailers that are publicly traded. It's credible. We know it's a good source. So we also sign a brand authorization to get the rights to be able to sell with them. So we take it in. And those enterprise retailers, they all have those UPC codes, right? They're going to require that. They're not going to let a unique identifier tag or an ASIN go into mass market retail store. So just inherently, that's who we should be working with because they have the biggest problem with returns. They have the most credible source to find that data, which is inside that G10 UPC code for us. And then on the other side, there's a lot of marketplaces that we sell through where we could ask for an exemption if there's no UPC, but we don't want to do that on a bunch of scattered inventory. So we get more bang for our buck because a lot of the marketplaces require or want that UPC. Yeah, we're seeing a lot more of that now because of what you just said. I'm, I'm glad that you validated this for me because- yep. We've been hearing about it and I kind of thought you might go that way, but e-commerce, it's the wild, wild west. It's the wild, wild universe, right? I mean, it's been around for over 20 years and we see it more and more every day, but now you're seeing like Amazon now requires a global trade item number to be registered for your product before they can list it on their site because of fraud and theft and counterfeit and other things. And it just dilutes the quality of stuff out there. You know, and, and more and more people want to know like origin, which also then ties back to sustainability. Who's doing what? Is it them being done the right ways? I'm thrilled to hear you say that. I mean, someone that really wasn't in on that piece of it before and you stated like never thought it would even come into play, but it's more important to us than I thought it would be. No, GS1, you guys are our best friends and you didn't even know it. It's also a part of your automation process, right? Yes. It's the scanning bit. It's the boom, scan it in, out, done, as yep. opposed to let's go look all this up and double check it and all those okay. things. So we ask two questions to all of our guests. The first is that you have tons of technology choices in your life, right? Whether it's personal or whether it's professional. What is your favorite piece of technology that you're using today? I'm old school because my notebook is a notebook. My computer is a Lenovo laptop and my phone is an Android. And I actually don't put my work email on my phone. I might cave in eventually, but a few years ago to give myself guardrails because after 6 p.m. I want work to shut off. So I actually don't value a lot of like the new this and the new that. But you know what's exciting to me is what everyone's talking about is chat GPT. AI. We use AI. Like if we create a listing and it's sort of weak in terms of its description, in yep. a second, we can accurately add to it and enhance it. But 
in other aspects, like I've thought of all these different little prompts that I can give it to go out and retrieve information to make my life easier. From a lead gen perspective, it's phenomenal. We don't do any outbound sales. We don't have a sales team or a salesperson. But when we get to it, I've already teed up who I need to talk to. And I have certain bits of information about them based on ideas that I've leveraged ChatGPT for. And you can't find everything, but it's incredible. And even if I wanted to send my wife a stupid love poem, just to be intentionally cheesy, I had this idea where I was like, you oh, wrote this- your Valentine's Day card no, I did. using chat I- GPT. No, I really did. I had this idea and I was like, oh, man, it'd be so funny to write a poem about that and text it to her. And I was like, I'm going to see what would happen if I gave a few prompts. And it gave this long thing and I texted it to her and her initial reaction was, this is hilarious. AI is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I never told her how I created it. She just, she instantly knew. Cause it was, yeah. I mean, it was long. I told it to be funny. I gave it a few things to layer in as to why I was right, what the poem should be about. And she just said, AI is incredible. She knew right off the bat. Right. So, it kind of sounds like you should have wrote roses are red. I'll see you at six. The dinner's on me. Try that, Reed. Give a prompt to your wife when you want to take her to dinner at six and have that turn that into a poem, maybe layer in a few other things. It's incredible, man. It is. I've messed around with it a little bit. The one last thing we would like to know, what's blown your mind in your lifetime? You know, either work, personal, related, just something that's blown your mind. If you have a consumer product company, what works now and what will work in five years is so different. The first business that I launched coming out of college, I mean, we sold to QVC and Walmart and Costco and Nordstrom and Dillard's and companies that aren't in business anymore, like Borders Books. The whole approach to that business, we didn't even do e-com sales. Back then, Amazon was a bookseller. This is 2007 to 2012. Instagram hadn't existed yet. There was no Kickstarter Nobody had heard of Shopify. And if you sold direct, it was kind of, why would you be doing that? That's what the retailers would ask. And I would say 95 plus percent at least of the retailers that we sold to, not the mass market ones that I mentioned, but the boutiques, they're all gone. The toy shops, the gift shops, the baby stores that we sold to in that era, there's probably (laughs) 1%, 2% left at best. So that's interesting to me. So When we sold that business in 12 and then I shifted my focus to e-com, a lot of the things that worked five years ago in e-commerce are very different, right? I mean, you can't just put up a Kickstarter, spend two grand on marketing and generate $300,000. You can no longer get the bang for your buck on Facebook where you would post an organic post and it would be way better than today's ad that costs you 50K. So you're paying more to get less with all forms of marketing now. And the cost of goods to bring things in is greater than ever. The cost of warehousing is far greater than ever. Online returns are going up, which is a real expense that nobody really layers into the discussion very often about the struggles of D2C. And so it's interesting where it was like all about brick and mortar when I first started. Then it was all about e-com and then it was about Amazon. And now it's what can I do? to not be a D2C purist and to not put all my eggs in a retailer basket. Like there are dozens, if not a hundred plus brands that 50% of their revenue was probably Bed Bath & Beyond. I mean, there's a lot. Now what? So everything changes and it changes relatively quickly. And that'll probably just escalate from here. So the thing that blows my mind is how fast things change and how fast you can become relevant and how fast you can become Irrelevant. Irrelevant. Unfortunately, nobody's really paying attention to how many good brands, good products, but over leveraged companies are just going to call it quits this year and next year. It's sad. You know, I spent my world in the D2C space and it's a battle. It's a struggle. But what does that mean? Because we're Americans. We're going to keep buying stuff. Even if we don't have the money to buy stuff, we will. E-com is not, it's really not going to go anywhere. There's going to be some level of brick and mortar, like, Malls won't disappear. Retail footprint will have to shrink, I'm sure, but it won't go away. So what does that mean? I think the unit economics that go into having a sustainable business that's not always on the verge of like, oh, if one thing goes wrong, we're toast. There's just a lot of things that will have to shift. Like you can't make money building a business 
selling a $15 anything as a D2C brand, maybe not even $20 because you have to right. eat the shipping and free shipping. Even if that stuff's free, that's not an assumption that anybody would have had 10 years ago. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out over time, but I'm here for it. Like I enjoy diving into these problems, trying not to create more problems for myself, trying to actually have a valuable solution and align myself with people like Sachin, who, you know, he built this tech for himself to resell a bunch of scattered inventory on his own. And he didn't set out to build an enterprise software, but what he has proven out, it's very difficult to duplicate. And so now, now it's our job to not screw this thing up and to get it into the hands of the right people that can use this little fulcrum to hopefully leverage and lift a lot more weight than they ever could in tackling this, what, $800 billion problem, whatever the number is, who knows, but it's a big problem. That's all the time we have for today. Ryan, thank you for spending the time with us. I mean, you've really enlightened us in a lot of different areas. And the one thing, there was a lot of things, but I'm like, hmm, he was a 3PL guy that hated to deal with returns. And now he's focused in on returns. It's just find the biggest problem, find the best solution to the problem, and then start driving that problem. So thank you very much for spending the time with us today. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for joining the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1US. If you enjoyed today's show, you can subscribe to our feed or explore more great episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to share and follow us on social media. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.